everybody. Welcome back to Psychedelics Today. This is Joe Moore coming at you from Breckenridge, Colorado. On this episode, we have Matt Siegel. Matt Siegel has been on the show before, I believe. Uh, Matt Siegel, PhD, received his doctoral degree in 2016 from the Philosophy, Cosmology, and Consciousness program at CIIS. His dissertation was titled, oh, here we go, Cosmo Theanthropic Imagination in the Post-Kantian Process Philosophy of Schelling and Whitehead. It grapples with the limits of knowledge, limits to knowledge of reality imposed by Kant's transcendental form of philosophy and argues that Schelling and Whitehead's process-oriented approach shows the way across the Kantian threshold to renewed experiential contact with reality. He teaches courses on German idealism and process philosophy with the PCC program at CIIS. And his website is footnotes, the number two, plato.com. And uh, what, what that comes from is that's uh, a quote from Whitehead, the safest generalization of the history of philosophy as it consists of a series of footnotes to Plato. And it's, uh, it's lovely to have Matt back on the show. He's uh, such an intelligent and you know, really careful guy looking at this whole psychedelic scene and philosophy and you know, how does... <laughs> philosophy relate to this whole psychedelic thing we've got going. So, you know, a lot of big discussions there to be had. I really like Matt. I could spend time with him on a few different occasions. And uh, I think Matt might also do some other uh, independent teaching elsewhere. So check him out. Very active on Twitter. Similarly, footnotes to Plato, uh, to the number two. And, uh, oh, here it is, uh, the real quote. The safest general characterization of the European philosophical tradition is that it consists of a series of footnotes to Plato. Alfred North Whitehead. Yeah. So <laughs> obviously Matt's into Whitehead. We are too. We've been thinking about how to really justify our interest in philosophy here. And I think there's a lot of angles, but you know, why do we talk to users, um, experiencers, people in our, in our workshops about philosophy? Because oftentimes psychedelics can force people into a philosophical crisis, a crisis of meaning and uh, having a background in philosophy can be helpful or engaging with philosophy can be really helpful. Yeah. So I, I really appreciate what Matt does. Really, really happy to be friends with him and uh, just really hope we can do more. Yeah. So uh, Matt D. Siegel, thank you for being on the show and can't wait to do it again. You know, really appreciate what you do and uh, keep on it. Yeah. And so I think that's it as a way of an intro. If you want to support us, uh, navigating psychedelics for clinicians and therapists, uh, (laughs) as I'm recording it, the July cohort starts tomorrow. It may or may not be full. And uh, you can jump in late if you'd like, but the next round is in September, starts September 23. And um, then we have an Australian group, an Australian cohort, and um, that starts on August 4. So if you're interested, you're in Australia or in a similar time zone, come on down. We've got some really great people there. And I'm really excited to uh, finally be doing some great work in Australia. We also have a, a number of webinars. If you're interested in learning more <laughs> about the class, uh, keep a lookout for webinars that we're hosting on the class. You can ask me questions and you know, see if it's a good fit for you. And, you know, worth noting, 14-day money-back guarantee, too. So if you're nervous, go for it. Anything else? Uh, I think that's it. Check us out on socials. Tell your friends about the podcast. And, uh, yeah, we'll see you on the other side. Thanks for tuning in and enjoy the episode. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Psychedelics Today. I'm joined today by Matt Siegel, Assistant Professor in the Department of Religion and Philosophy at CIIS. How are you doing today, Matt? Doing really well. It's great to be with you, back with you again, Joe. I think we did this like three years ago. Ages. Yeah. We're coming up on being five years old. So old man in the podcast game at this point. <laughs> uh, but yeah, like we, we connected over philosophy. Like you, you and I got to um, know each other a little bit at a conference in Claremont a while ago, focused on the topic of uh, what was it? Can extraordinary experience help save the planet or something? <laughs> something good, goofy yeah. like that. Yeah. And that was a pretty cool conference because we had John Cobb there and a number of Naropa people, priests from all over. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's really neat. Yeah. uh, Yeah. And John Cobb was there to sort of welcome us and situate us. And, you know, I think that's the perfect context within which to study the 
potential impact of psychedelics. Like you want to study it neuroscientifically, but you also want to get the theologians and the philosophers and, and the therapists, the psychologists in there, because it's relevant to all these different disciplines. Quite. Yeah. So I reached out, um, what was it, probably a month ago now or more uh, to get you on the show because I've, I've been noticing this kind of um, dominance of discussion around neurophysiology, brain imaging. And um, it seems like, you know, while a pretty picture made by some expensive machines is convincing, it it's not really convincing enough. And I just kind of wanted to hear your, you know, critiques on this stuff, like mathematical models can bring us a little bit further, but, but it's not the whole picture, right? Or how do you like to talk about this fun stuff? Well, I love neuroscience and mm -hmm. I think all the big, fancy, expensive machines and you know, like the fMRI machines and PET scanners and, and whatever, you know, the next decade of innovation will bring us. I'm fascinated by that sort of research. And so the question is, you ask, is it convincing? And I think if the argument is that this type of neuroimaging, neuroscientific research can explain consciousness, can it can convincingly explain consciousness? No, I don't think that's convincing. I, I don't think neuroscience, when when it's trying to measure, you know, whatever it might be, the the, the flow of glucose through the brain or the electrochemical activity, the, the electrical activity um, in the brain, it's it's measuring an effect of something, consciousness, I guess, and for it to say that the effect it's measuring is the cause of consciousness? I'm not saying consciousness is necessarily the cause. That's a philosophical question we could get into. But there seems to be a misplaced causation when what really neuroscience with these brain scanners, what, what, they're, what it's doing is correlating um, a measurement with a report, a subjective report from you know, whoever's brain's being scanned. And that's correlation is not causation, right? It's sort of basic philosophy of science. And so, yeah, as long as neuroscience isn't pretending to explain consciousness, as long as it acknowledges that it's offering a description, then those descriptions are super useful to anyone interested in, in understanding consciousness. But we're going to need more than neuroscience to understand consciousness. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. So... <laughs> This idea of explaining consciousness is, is a really complicated <laughs> question, right? Mm -hmm. Because, you know, the neuroscientists think they have, you know, some sort of reasonable definition, but do they? Like, do you, do you have something you lean on as like a good kind of framing of or definition around consciousness? Consciousness is that from out of which definitions arise, I guess. <laughs> mm. <laughs> but it, it's it's you know that what that it's that which allows us to recognize anything definite, mm -hmm. and so it's inherently going to be a paradoxical subject to inquire into. I mean, because right off the bat, right is is consciousness. I mean, on the one hand, it's clearly a subject; it is subjectivity itself. But for us to try to study it scientifically, we we're going to need to turn it into some kind of object. And so somehow consciousness is both subject and object at once. As soon as you start inquiring into it, it you know, and this is where I, I would want to go with this question about consciousness. It, it immediately, even if you begin pursuing it as a purely natural scientific question uh, about how neurophysiology operates, if you if you follow the questions openly and honestly, you have to see how as I just said, consciousness is not just an object. It's also the very subject asking the question. Mm -hmm. it, it's, it's the subject who is pursuing knowledge of an object, which is not just an object in the case of consciousness, but also a subject. So it's, it's inherently circular re and recursive. And so you, you, you immediately find yourself doing metaphysics. And this is why it's such a vexed issue in academic philosophy and in 
um, neuroscience. I mean, a lot of neuroscientists don't even want to publish about consciousness because they don't consider it to be a meaningful term. You know, they'll talk about things like attention and they can track attention and measure attention in, in their research laboratories, but they don't even want to talk about consciousness because we end up doing philosophy immediately. Mm. And so, you know, honestly, I don't know that consciousness should really be a subject for neuroscientists to be discussing with one another in their journals. It, we could have other interdisciplinary conferences and journals where neuroscientists are engaging with philosophers and theologians and psychologists about the question of of consciousness. That would be valuable and interesting, but it doesn't strike me that consciousness is even I don't think it can be defined in a narrowly neuroscientific way. Mm -hmm. Right. Possibly the wrong tool for the job. Right. And, you know, we could assume that maybe we would have an answer by now if it was something that was possible. Mm -hmm. Maybe, 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 maybe. I understand we're dealing with one of the most complicated organs in the body, but, or in the, the known world. But, um, yeah, so... I think William James had something along the lines of it being just like this passing flow of thought. It's kind of like, you know, what is monkey mind? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Consciousness is monkey mind. But I, you know, William James didn't have a lot of colleagues to be, that he could be working with at the time, you know, at the level he was operating, I think. Mm. But you might have a different opinion to that. I don't know. Well, I mean, he certainly had his friend, troubled friend, but genius, um, Charles Saunders Peirce, Peirce yeah. who um, had a lot of interesting things to say about the nature of consciousness and its relationship to the brain. He, you know, Peirce and James, they're both like, um, I would say they're panpsychists, right? And so for them, consciousness isn't produced inside of the skull uh, as the sort of excretion of an extremely complicated organ, the equivalent of what bile is, you know, to, to the liver or, or <laughs> to the bladder, that's what consciousness right. is to the brain, right? That would be the materialist explanation. But, you know, James and, and Peirce, and, you know, there's also another important philosopher that James was in dialogue with, an idealist, uh, Josiah Royce. I don't know if you're familiar with him, but he was- No, I haven't heard the name, no. An American- Hegelian uh, idealist philosopher and he and James would get into lots of arguments, but they were really good friends. And so, you know, it, James isn't a materialist, but he's not an idealist. He's, he's, he called himself a radical empiricist, which means he thought that ultimately reality was experiential. Mm. That, that, and in this way, obviously he's an influence on Whitehead. So that whatever reality is, finally, it's not going to be mere matter in motion, and it's not going to be mere ideas in eternity. It's going to be experience, which is kind of like between somewhere. Experience seems to exist between mind and matter, or between a merely material world and a supreme ideal world. Experience is always like the tension between those two poles, and that's where James thought that we should look for an account of the ultimate nature of reality. It's going to be something experiential. It's going to be something, you know, we could use the term aesthetic, like, mm -hmm. you know, aesthetics, like the study of beauty, but aesthesis, really, it means it refers to sensation, perception, experience. And so I think... If we're going to try to understand consciousness and and you know the nature of psychedelic experience and what it reveals to us about consciousness, I think we're lured in this direction of something like what James called radical empiricism, where the ultimate nature of reality becomes itself something experiential. And so, in that context, you know, what a brain scan's telling us? Well, they're telling us kind of what experience might look like if we localize it in one place, but ultimately the brain is always in a body embedded in a world of other bodies, people, um, a whole ecosystem. And so our brain is just a node in that larger network. And so consciousness can't be simply located in just inside the skull. Mm -hmm. 
Right. Yeah. Our, our easy workaround at psychedelics today is uh, mind is at the very least diffused throughout the body, but we don't yeah. say anything about consciousness <laughs> and we don't like throw in the, the stuff that kind of beyond biology too regularly unless we're That's trying fair. to talk Groff and stuff. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because this stuff can happen. Like weird shit happens. That's not really easy to describe, you know, like what happens when a psychic phenomenon pops up or like, you know, stuff like Sheldrake talks about. Mm-hmm. Yeah. There's just so much phenomena that can happen. That's kind of like <sighs> right on the heels of kind of, do- I don't really know the polite way to put it, but the dominant f- way of doing science like you know mm-hmm. pavlovianism behavior is you know um neuroscience like stuff's great it like has effects clearly you know replicable and helpful but you know it's not the full story and hmm, yeah do you how do you deal with that in in class or do you do you when you're teaching students well we don't get too many materialists good point at cis <laughs> but we you know i try to the danger is when you become too spiritual is that you think that the physical world doesn't really ex- exist or right. it, it is somehow merely apparent or is the, as if conscious, you know, this whole like what the bleep do we know type of worldview where <laughs> consciousness is what's responsible for creating reality is, is highly, is just as problematic as materialism mm-hmm. because it's, it's a, grasping for certainty and you can grasp in either direction towards matter or towards mind in the search for some sense of mm-hmm. certainty and i don't think that and i think the, the psychedelic experience kind of forces this realization upon you and if you resist it you're going to have a pretty terrible time you know there is no certainty there is no solid like foundation that you could drop anchor into and just hold on to you know, to keep you safe. Like reality is, uh, if it's experiential, it's kind of groundless, right? There's no final veil that will be pulled back and so that naked truth can stare you in the face. It's, there's always going to be, um, a further unveiling. And so certainty in that context becomes the real danger. And we have to avoid dogmatism around that in the materialist form as well as in the spiritual form. And so I think I, you know, it depends on who I'm talking to. Mm -hmm. If I'm talking to people who seem more like they're spiritual bypassing, then I'll say like, Hey, have you read this, this brain study about people who are low on or iron deficient or, you know, don't have vitamin B or whatever and what happens to their cognition. And that's interesting, isn't it? Because obviously, like, (laughs) neurochemistry is not incidental. It's not incidentally related to our consciousness. It's just not the whole story. But we can't Mm -hmm. leave it out of the story. Exactly. So, yeah, I kind of try to find a a middle ground. Mm. Yeah, it's kind of like this um, science as like a series of provisional truths. And we're like, this is going to be just a continuous march of progress. And like we should be in dialogue with other disciplines. I I tend to see people in academic circles, not wanting to touch metaphysics, philosophy, et cetera, probably at great cost to their work. You know, imagine if they, well, go ahead. Sorry. Well, I just think it's fine for like neuroscientists or other scientists who have specialized in a particular discipline to do that work and not have to worry about metaphysics they can't. I mean, that's, that's just, it's, you can't do good experimental work if you're trying to figure out metaphysical problems. So I I don't necessarily think that neuroscientists need to venture into metaphysics. I just think they need to be aware of when they're interpreting their own research findings in a metaphysical way. Mm -hmm. And that's where the interdisciplinary work comes in, you know, so we need scientists to do science and we need philosophers to to engage in in dialogue with with scientists and not merely to help clarify the scientific concepts but to make sure that those concepts are remaining coherent with the like hardcore common sense presuppositions of our human existence 
and our human consciousness. You know, hardcore common sense presuppositions is is this term that David Ray Griffin, uh, a Whiteheadian philosopher, came up with, and he thinks that you know reductionistic science, when it oversteps the bounds of science and becomes metaphysics, that it um, ends up falling into some kind of performative self contradiction, which is to say that the science. The the neuroscientist who says consciousness is just a brain excretion determined by uh, neural behaviors, which are genetically coded and ultimately a product of blind natural selection, they're undermining their own capacity as a scientist to have discovered that fact and to have articulated it. So in other words, if what they're saying about the brain is true, they shouldn't exist in order to say that it's true, right? Mm. a purposive, conscious, intelligent science uh, scientist should never have emerged if that's all that the brain amounts to. And so it's a performative self-contradiction. And philosophers are supposed to remind the scientists when they make claims that are incoherent. Mm. Yeah. And and we see this kind of... Um... You know Neil deGrasse Tyson, you pointed out recently on, on Twitter, and same with Dawkins, they're, they're quite regularly kind of shitting on philosophy and i don't understand why because just like you said like they'll they'll shit on philosophy on one hand and then they'll make philosophical statements well exactly they'll they'll say we should avoid philosophy at all costs and then they'll go to do bad philosophy and and i guess they they calling it science (laughs) but i i get it because if i mean science as an institution is really under attack right now Mm-hmm. Think of all the skepticism around vaccines and, and right. the skepticism around climate change, uh, at least in America. And it's it's not like science retains the sort of institutional authority that it once held. I, I mean, it's been totally politicized. And so I get why Dawkins and and Neil deGrasse Tyson and others are Lawrence Krauss is another one, right? These pop, these they're scientists themselves, and they're popularizers of science. They, um, I think, they're worried about losing that clout in the culture, and so they're lashing out at philosophy, which is weird because it's not like <laughs> philosophy is has a higher ground to stand on in terms of public opinion. I mean, right? At least again, I, I, in America, I think there are celebrity philosophers in countries like France and, and, and in Europe. So it's a little different over there, but in, in America, nobody cares what the, philo- what the philosophers think. And, but for some reason, I don't, scientists are attacking philosophers when really we need to be, we need to be allied with each other as, you know, pre- preservers, protectors, and advancers of, of human knowledge. And I don't get why, there needs to be a, a turf war between science and philosophy unless the scientists have mistaken their craft for theology. You know, and that's, I don't, <laughs> Dawkins did science when he was a molecular biologist in the 70s and 60s, but I think for the last couple of decades, he's been doing theology, really. <laughs> in other words, he's been turning science into a worldview, scientism. And he's been preaching about its virtues, and he's been he's been damning those who hold to some theistic view as backward, and trying to convert them to his his religion of scientism. And you know he's so he's a he is a preacher now. He's a priest and he's a theologian, and that's the level at which he engages in the culture war mm. as a scientific priest. And you know I, it's not like when when he's up against a fundamentalist uh creationist christian with patriarchal and racist you know political views i'm on dawkins side in that debate but when he's going up against philosophy as a the whole of philosophy and saying that it's worthless and dismissing it he's just sawing off the branch that he stands on and he's not recognizing the role that he plays culturally which He's he's the head of, you know, one of the high priests of of a religion, in fact. Mm. Uh, <laughs> let's have you 
talk about scientism for a minute. Like what is, what is that? Scientism is the view that the scientific method provides us with the only means of procuring truth and that questions of morality and, and value and questions of you know all, any other question that human beings might ask ultimately needs to be translated into the scientific form of statement and that if we cannot arrive at a truth by means of the scientific method and we have to get into what what that method is but then then it is not of value it is not worthy of our attention so it's kind of like the new name for positivism yeah okay i think that's that's fair though positivism was a little bit more restrained you know like the, a logical positivist in the vienna circle you know a century ago would have just been more of a quietist about metaphysical questions and said look all we can know is what we perceive through our senses and classify, you know, mathematically or logically. We can't know what might be beyond the sensory realm. You know, this like like we, the behaviorist wouldn't say that mind doesn't exist necessarily. They just say, I'm only going to explain everything as if it was just the behavior that mm -hmm. was at play, and I'm going to make predictions based on how things behave. But the Nowadays, scientism also seems to imply this kind of materialistic explanation that it's not just limiting science to a kind of sensory empiricism. It's saying, no, we can offer an expl a, a metaphysical causal explanation that posits some kind of mechanism operating behind the scenes beyond our ability to perceive and that that's the cause of what we do perceive. You know, so I don't think a positivist necessarily would say consciousness is just a brain secretion. Mm -hmm. They would say that's not, a, we can't ask the question scientifically about consciousness. Whereas you now someone who holds to scientism nowadays, there'd be more of an attempt to reduce consciousness into materialistic terms. And so like, instead of talking about Ultimately, instead of talking about like falling in love with someone, you talk about falling into a rhythm of mutual um, oxytocin stimulation or something. And so it would it would be a, a program for culture to become more materialistic in its way of you know understanding how humans do what they do. Mm. Does, that, does that make sense? So yeah, totally. So, yeah, it's like horrifically minimalizing you know, some of the things that we should really hold most dear. Well, it's, yeah, it's, um, at times, not always, I guess. I mean, and I don't want to, you know, there are like eliminative materialist philosophers and neuroscientists, and I don't want to imply that they're like horrible people or something, not at all. I just think that there are, there are implications uh, at the level of like psychology and, and like self-esteem that these ways of describing human life, their implications, right? For how it makes people feel. And for a panpsychist like me, or a radical empiricist, like we were talking about earlier, I think how human beings come to feel about the nature of their existence contributes in large part to the nature of that existence. And so, in other words, it's so participatory that like, as as we become more and more convinced that humans are nothing but complicated computers, and as we become more and more convinced that the computers we surround ourselves with are artificially intelligent, we're actually, I think we're making ourselves more me mechanical and digital and and algorithmic in our behavior, just because we think of ourselves that way. Mm -hmm. And because we surround ourselves with machines and screens that, um, in a very behaviorist way, train us to behave as if we were machines. <laughs> yeah, that's fascinating. Like it's our, for most people, you know, the modern cell phone is the thing we interact with the most, more so than humans or animals often. And yep. yeah, like if that's our primary relationship in our experience, then what does that do long-term? Nobody knows, but, uh, you know, <laughs> the, 
the Zoomers are like the first generation of humans to just come out of the womb with that as their basic, you know, with, with, with the internet as their environment, <laughs> their primary mm-hmm. environment. Mm-hmm. So we'll see what happens. <laughs> so, you know, my suspicion is that this, this kind of, um, behaviorist path leads us, you know, in, in kind of a dangerous direction, positivist scientist direction, a little bit away from our humanity and like the full expression of, of humanity and maybe who, how we want to express our lives and whatnot. So it just seems like a a dark and and treacherous path. Like for instance, (laughs) one result would be psychiatry's total domination of the psychedelic experience, which, which seems like it's one likely outcome. And there's a lot of money on, on the table, you know, to try to keep it there, I think. Yeah. I mean, it's psychiatry, but, and the whole medical, but it's the, it's the corporate dimension of it too. Like Compass Pathways trying to patent psilocybin and they're even, you know, funding the campaign against a proposition in Oregon, I believe, where oh yeah, they don't want psychedelics to be decriminalized because they want to have a monopoly on pres- prescribing psilocybin. Um, right. <clears throat> and so it's, yeah, it's, it's, um, sinister really that, but it's not surprising, you know, that capitalism would corrupt even something as potentially healing as these, these plant medicines. But that's, that's the thing. I mean, capitalism can co-opt anything, uh, for profit. Uh, it turns us, it, 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 it harnesses our most pro-social instincts and emotions and uses them against us. And that's, you know, what's, what's happening with psychedelics, I think. And I, but there, there will be, and there is resistance to this sort of thing. And, you know, so we don't need to like throw in the towel or anything, (laughs) but it's true that there are dark forces at play. And I, you know, I don't want to other and like project out these dark forces. Like the thing about capitalism is it it lives inside of each of us uh, at the level of our desires and our drives because we've been shaped by it. So we can't pretend like it's this big, bad uh, monster out there that other people believe in. Like the problem with capitalism is that it's not just the worldview you decide to believe in or not. It is the very structure again of, of your desires and your sense of identity, you know, so it's, it's inside of you. And I think when I just think of my own past psychedelic experiences, one of the real gifts has been at least a heightened sensitivity to the, to the role that, that these sort of cultural algorithms and the, the, the memetics of capitalism, the, the way that it infects me and, 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 you know, I remember the one of the early times. I think just smoking cannabis and looking at a a one dollar bill uh, USD and just <laughs> seeing the absurdity of like money. Like, why mm. does anyone take this piece of paper and like same piece of paper you put a different couple of numbers on it and all of a sudden it's worth way more? It's just such a bizarre thing. And you know, I've I don't know that I would have noticed that about money without that altered perception and. But I guess nowadays, uh, everybody knows money is funny. Mm. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, more so than ever, totally. But maybe not enough yet, right? Right. Yeah, that critique needs to be understood, totally. You know, alt alt currencies help a little bit, like exposing the, like, uh, absurdity of it. But it's not, like, the best solution, really. Right. Who knows what that best solution is (laughs) yet. Right. Yeah. Hmm. Right. So like figuring out how to expose that in us. I, I think that's one of the things I'm interested about, interested in psychedelics for is this, this realization, you know, I call that like the, uh, the realization or experience of the Babylon system. It's kind of like, yeah. you know, pull on like some Rasta stuff. And I'm like, I think that's like kind of a helpful framing. It's like, okay, we live inside this thing and you know, like they call it burning down B- Babylon. Right. But it's just using cannabis and you know, you have these revelations about, society and culture and on one hand they can be a little crippling on the other hand they're insightful and quite helpful right yeah i mean that's what they they say like um 
cannabis causes problems with motivation. And it's like, well, yeah, once you see through the uh, value structure of our society, you'd lose motivation to participate because <laughs> it's no longer appetizing to you to engage in the rat race. Mm-hmm. Right. You know, you know, that's these kind of um, interesting projects like the Arun project, North Star pledge, all that stuff. It's like, you know, just a heads up, this is coming, mm-hmm. you know, someday you might find yourself in a position you didn't expect to be in later in life. Yeah. You, you escaped corporate America to reenter corporate America. <laughs> um, <laughs> and, and, you know, I spent 19 years in corporate America. It was pretty, you know, horrible. Mm. Like, sure. I made a bunch of money, but it was not a great scene. Like it definitely took years off my life. <laughs> I probably earned a number of surgeries through my kind of time there. Yeah. Mm. So, you know, people should definitely be careful. Yeah. There was, I don't know if you've noticed, um, I don't remember the YouTube channel, but someone's been releasing these tapes of, um, Alan Watts that I hadn't heard before. And one of them's a conversation. I've seen you posting them. They're really good. Yeah. There's one where it's, it's Watts and Tim Leary, Alan Ginsberg and uh, the poet Gary Snyder talking about, you know, the political events of their day in the late sixties and trying to understand what Leary meant by drop out. And he was trying to defend the slogan and, and others were like, yeah, well, what do you really mean by that? Cause it, did you really drop out? Like here you are in the middle of San Francisco, you're not growing your own food. And so he was trying <laughs> to explain what he means by drop out. And uh, it's basically don't let the, the corporate sort of anesthetized, you know, dream of just work hard enough and you'll finally get to own that new shiny thing or that slightly larger home or whatever. And instead recognize that, um, you know, it's nice to have nice things, but not if you're selling your soul for decades to somebody else who's exploiting your labor and destroying the planet. But we haven't learned that lesson, you know. Uh, 50 years later now after they had this you know after Larry was saying to turn on tune in and drop out a lot of people thought that they followed his instructions but again capitalism co-opted the whole hippie movement and like by the 90s they were selling Che Guevara t-shirts at the shopping mall <laughs> <laughs> and then mm. Apple was using the Beatles to sell computers mm-hmm mm-hmm Right. So the most revolutionary of things like can quite often be co-opted and have a substantially different impact than was intended. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, can you imagine like, didn't, I almost feel like, uh, Philip K. Dick wrote this novel that has like a corporation like Compass Pathways trying to <laughs> patent the psilocybin molecule and be like the sole proprietor. It almost to me sounds like a Philip K. Dick sci-fi dystopia or something. Mm, right. So we're <laughs> people need to read Philip K. Dick, by the way. That's a great reference. Like it's uh dark and scary, but essential. Some of them are actually kind of light, <laughs> but you know, the darker ones I think are more impactful. Well, he seems to have been some kind of a uh, unwitting Gnostic initiate, like kind of happens, <laughs> seems like it happened on accident to him, but mm-hmm. he was definitely seeing, seeing between worlds. So we're trying to address this through like one of our newer projects is enabling clergy uh, and other religious leaders to, to figure out a place in this whole situation. Mm-hmm. Because, you know, how, how bad would compass look if, you know, they were suing, you know, 500 priests. Right. Or, you know, tribal leaders. Right. So, and, and is there a way that Compass could be sued? I think you saw this person on Twitter recently um, talking about uh, Article 31 of the UN Declaration of Indigenous Rights or something like that. Yeah. Where there might be room for reparation type lawsuits towards Compass and, and other groups who have made a, a ton of money. I don't know how actual that could be, but it's an interesting angle nonetheless. Well, I'm sure Compass has um, a big legal fund saved up for that. So mm-hmm. that's a good point. Yeah, I guess you can buy your way out of almost anything if you've got the funds. Oh yeah, I mean, if they're already 
lobbying politic and you know politically to get certain laws passed or not passed they're they're clearly um part of the funding for their operation is to buy off politicians and get their own laws written and and have legal teams to fight back against the little people Mm -hmm. so do you like uh i'm sure you've thought about this a little bit but have you have you seen a way beyond like this kind of weird dominator move by compass yeah ending capitalism hmm. <laughs> and do you do that with guns or how do you do it oh i don't know i have no idea <laughs> yeah i don't know i think part of it is just like trying to shift the way that liberals tend to think about these questions like they get really mad at facebook you know for being biased in what ads they allow and not censoring certain things and selling at, you know, ads to Russians and stuff. And it's like, well, no one ever, a, a corporation is, has one purpose to maximize a, a publicly traded corporation has yeah. one purpose to maximize shareholder profits. Mm-hmm. And that's the business model for Facebook. And so they'll take money from anyone who wants to sell ads. They're a private company. You know, they're not a public utility that has, anywhere in its corporate charter, like as part of its mission, improving civil society, you know, or helping America maintain its, why do we, it's democracy. Like, why would we expect a private corporation to do that? There's no incentive in capitalism for that. And yet we get mad and blame Mark Zuckerberg. Why aren't we blaming capitalism? That's, you know, where the source code for this problem is. Mm. And so I think we single out, and I don't even like I love Bernie, but I don't like the way he singles out individual billionaires and CEOs. Like, like that this is that the problem we're faced with is just a individual moral failing. If only it were that simple, you know. It's it's not about that. It's it's the it's the system code. It's the corporate charter law, you know, that gives mm-hmm. corporations legal personhood and absolves the actual human individuals that run those companies and the executives that make decisions of legal repercussions and even financial repercussions usually uh, for the crimes that they commit. But even just an economy that only values growth and financial growth, which is enriching fewer and fewer. And it's like we have an economic system where the best way to measure how many people are being exploited, how many people's labor is being exploited, and to measure how quickly the earth's ecosystems are being degraded is to see how much money is, is in circulation, Mm. right? As the money supply or, or as the economy grows, let's say as GDP goes up, that's the best indicator that the quality of the the lives of the laborers and uh, the quality of the soil and the, the, the climate and the oceans and all these things is going down. Right. So that's quite a horrific, unimaginably horrific situation to be in. And how do we change that? I mean, I guess our only hope is is um, consciousness. You know, like it's a matter of recognizing that we're we're responsible for creating the world we inhabit together. But mm. we, we've we've become so convinced by a certain kind of technological progress, and we've just become convinced by that so that we believe any problem can be solved, even climate change. We just need more technology. And I don't know that that's, uh, it's like, it's like a nightmare we have to wake up from, you know? And I <laughs> mm-hmm. think I used to think it was as simple as we just got to dose everybody, but obviously that's not going to work because I think most of Twitter's workforce is microdosing, And since the pandemic, probably full dosing <laughs> right. working from home. But so yeah, psychedelics aren't necessarily going to wake us up, but I think that's why we need we need philosophy, you know, like these substances and these experiences need to be contained within a meaningful story and a meaningful th- theory of reality, right? So that so that we can make sense of what we're experiencing and integrate it and you know, not only come out of those experiences with a profound sense of what's wrong with our society, but with at least a good idea for what we'd like instead. And, and then we can get to work, you know, trying to build that. But yeah, the short answer is, I don't know. I don't know how we get out of it. 
<laughs> mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Right. I the new the new thing um, Lenny Gibson's been saying to us as things become you know seemingly more more and more dark over time is this um, Bucky Fuller line about you know as growth rates uh, are kind of exponential. Uh, extinctions becoming, you know, accelerating quite a bit and you know, things are looking pretty dire, but what what else is an exponential and it's uh, human creativity and imagination. So this is, you know, the, the palliative Lenny's kind of giving us to say like, you know, we might get through, like there, there is a chance and it, you know, it comes down to like, how can we maximize creativity and, and problem solving and, you know, what new ways of being and existing and, and doing commerce and all this other stuff could come in that could be helpful. Right. But how do we incentivize that and create those centers that can like maximize this? Like that's a different story. Cause I don't, I don't necessarily see funding for that right now. Yeah. I don't see it either. And it would have to be sort of a distributed network of local economies. And, and, you know, the, there's a chance that the, the internet, which is causing a lot of our problems now with social media sort of pathologically retribalizing us but the internet could also be our salvation if it and it's again it's not necessarily going to look like exactly like digital currency as it exists now but something like you know a distributed network or world computer where the economy runs on because it already kind of does run on like attention and if if we can shift out of this negative attention downward spiral into a positive attention upward spiral you know, so like instead of, I guess, what gets called cancel culture, it would be more mm-hmm. like we'd have a co-learning culture <laughs> where we're we're all sort of trying to level up together instead of tear one another down. And I do think that, as, you know, there's to, to, we, we've we mostly been lumping all the psychedelics together in this conversation. And I know you guys don't do that psychedel- with psychedelics today, but there's there's cl- clearly different different benefits that each of these different substances has. And if we can, I guess, add a bit more like MDMA into the way that we engage. And so that we don't, when we're, even if we are interacting over a digital interface or medium of some kind, that we don't lose sight of the person on, and the, the persons on the other side, mm. because it's, it seems to be that that increased like abstraction and sense of distance from whoever we're engaging with is what leads to the vitriol. Uh, and the dehumanization and the cancel culture stuff, because we've just forgotten that there's a fallible, you know, finite flesh, living, breathing human being on the other end of the screens that we're increasingly in front of. And so, I don't know, I think the internet might help us into that new kind of cooperative economy that I, I heard you, you know, beginning to to dream about there. Mm. Right. And I guess the other extension is like you, if we had uh, some sort of rational UBI, like creativity could probably be unleashed even further Yeah, because we're not, yeah. you know, driving four hours to get to, you know, your, what, your Palo Alto office to make your 200,000 a year. You're okay. Like, let's actually do what I want to do and see how many people I can help. And that was the, that's another like kind of Bucky idea. So it's not necessarily about psychedelics, but it's, you know, what, what are the constraints on human creativity, imagination, you know, positive production and that that's kind of it. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, you know, psychedelics are kind of like one example of a new type of economy that where experiences are of value rather than products, you Mm -hmm. know, um, and that the point of human life rather than being to accumulate more and more things is to experience more and more to grow and, and learn and understand. And, you know, you can really only do that sort of thing in, in cooperation with others. And so it's, it's just shifting us away from an acquisitive and acquisitive culture and, and a, you know, a culture of accumulation towards, you know, a culture of, I guess there's different ways to get at it of, of community and of curiosity and wonder and, you know, where we don't like, clutch after certainty or deny the fact that we're going to die one day. Cause I mean, that's, I haven't mentioned death denial. Mm. That's going to be in the background of this capitalist rat race also. And, and, and it's something you're confronted with on when you're having a psychedelic experience, 
typically there's a, a, a confrontation with death mm-hmm. and being able to to face that and not turn away in fear is probably a big part of you know letting go of the anxiety that seems to be driving this capitalist mentality mm. right death being something that we don't talk about very often and perhaps this is where judicious psychedelic use can in a sense, inoculate us from that fear. Mm. Right. That was potentially, (laughs) potentially the primary result of the Eleusinian mysteries. I don't know if that's really true, but some, some of them said something along those lines. Yeah. I think that's a fair enough explanation of what that mystery, right. Was about, but, uh, yeah, to be able to die while still alive. Mm Mm-hmm. This is something, you know, we don't have, modern societies generally don't have um, initiation rites, initiation rituals. And so there's not that, you know, as a 13, 14 year old, you don't typically, you might be a kid bar mitzvah or bat mitzvah or something or the uh, confirmed or whatever, depend, you know, whatever the, your religious tradition does, but it, it's, it's not as... Um, you don't necessarily experience, you don't have a death rebirth experience necessarily during your confirmation, typically. <laughs> right. Um, whereas if you drop 500 micrograms of LSD or you eat five grams of mushrooms, you're, t- you're probably going to get close to that threshold, if not pass through it, and uh, come out the other side and realize you're still here. Mm-hmm. And I think that's a profoundly reorienting experience. And if most of the people in, in a society don't get to have that experience, then they're going to take death very seriously and probably have a very short-sighted understanding of, of its meaning. Mm. Mm-hmm. <sighs> yeah, that's a big one. So <laughs> through all of these discussions, Matt, we haven't really had to lean on you know, the, the new phrenology to, you know, not to shit on it totally, but because neuroimaging is helpful, but, you know, Mm -hmm. in a way we haven't had to lean on that to have all these kind of really deep, meaningful conversations about, you know, life and the future of humanity on the planet and implications beyond that, right? Like this is maybe a way of looking at it. Like, hey, we just did all this. We didn't have to talk about the amygdala once. Yeah, it's true. And, you know, I think the, the brain has a very... It has a vital function in in our organism, but it doesn't need to be the final explanation. Uh, and particularly, a sort of um, you know, these brain scan images are like averages of of many different subjects' experiences. And the the, the reality is that like each individual person, when you scan their brain and they do whatever the experiment is, they have a slightly different. Act, signature of activity in their brain, but it all gets averaged together to create these images that you see in the in the articles or the magazines or whatever. And it's 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 an artifact. It's a it's a construct, and um, it's almost like it functions as religious icon, icon, uh, iconography. And I get it. It's powerful, and it's amazing that we can measure the brain at that level of resolution and getting better all the time. But yeah, it's not, you know, it's akin to a, at least literal or debased understanding of um, transubstantiation as if like the wafers really are becoming the flesh of God. That's like when you think a picture of uh, what part of the brain was activated and say that's consciousness. It's a similar sort of magic trick you're trying to pull off there. Meg, but again, I think I wouldn't want to say that uh, the the communion ritual itself or the Eucharist might it might not it might have a, a deeper meaning to it. So I'm not trying to dismiss that. You know, eating psychedelics is itself, I think, a form of communion, right? Where mm-hmm. you eat the flesh of the mushroom and realize that uh, oh yeah, I am. God is now part of me and I am part of God. And um, it's in one way to describe what you experience, but it is a ritual of communion, but in a, in a more sort of literalistic way, when the science, neuroscientist says that 
this brain scan explains consciousness, they're asking us to believe in magic. Mm. And, and I think there are more coherent explanations that fill out more of the picture and so don't require that we you know, think of ourselves as just m- machines that behave according to these deterministic laws that neuroscience is eventually going to uncover. Hmm. McKenna had some line about every kind of um, belief system having like a big pill you got to swallow. Yeah. And, you know, in scientism, it's the Big Bang, right? And, uh, right. and, uh, and there's plenty of others all over the religious world. So, mm-hmm. you know, there is a hard pill to swallow. Indeed. Even <laughs> in this kind of materialist frame. And yeah, like that, that Eucharist example is really interesting because it's been coming up a lot for me lately. And, mm. You know, what does it mean that people just do it and don't necessarily have any effect, don't really believe it's body, the body and blood of Christ? And what happens when you really believe it? Or could psychedelics done skillfully in a religious setting help empower future, you know, religious services? Like, okay, you, you really understand what the ritual means now, maybe. And you really yeah. feel a yeah. benefit from and it. Then- it would probably become, I mean, I think you're, you can take communion every day, not just on Sunday. I, I believe so. Yeah. That might be a bit much if you were actually doing a psychedelic ritual, uh, communion. Um, but I can uh-huh. see like, <laughs> oh, I meant you do the psychedelic ritual once and then the future non psychoactives could be like potentiated yeah, yeah. long term. Right. I would say I, w- I've, I've thought that once a month with, with mushrooms might be a good rhythm on the full moon or the new moon or something. And, and then you, you can do it symbolically every day or, or, you know, every Sunday or, or whatever, just to Mm. sort of remember the purpose of the, of of actually imbibing, um, you know, a psychoactive substance. But, uh, yeah, I mean, ultimately I think what I've, what I've been trying to say this whole time is, is that there's a need to reintegrate, science with religion because when when science and religion part ways and sort of try to do what they need to do independent of the other you get scientism and you get fundamentalism and that's that's problematic we need science and religion to be working together to help us sort out the nature of human experience and you know, if there's going to be a psychedelic science, it's definitely going to have spiritual motivations underlying it and um, spiritual effects. And so we need a uh, religious container for that sort of activity. And so, yeah, just I, I, I think um, we've been shitting on, I hope I'm allowed to curse on your podcast, sorry. Yes. Okay, great. We've been shitting on scientism and neuroscience, but it's 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 just that on its own, it becomes, it risks being, becoming dogmatic, just as religion on its own risks being, uh, becoming dogmatic. And so I hope that, you know, the takeaway can be, we need to integrate science and religion if we want to understand consciousness, if we, certainly if we want to understand the psychedelic experience. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, you know, Whitehead does a good job with this, at least setting the stage for us to do this going forward. And, um, you know, he's essentially Plato, but he's got all the scientific um, discoveries Mm -hmm. of the last couple thousand years at his disposal. And yeah, does an amazing job with it. And I, I like to lean on that as a framework for going forward, but I, I don't know. Do you, do you think idealism like German idealism might, might have a substantial role going forward as well? I think so. I think, um, you know, Whitehead was not himself an idealist or he didn't think of himself as an idealist, but I think for a lot of people who are more materialistically inclined, he sure sounds like an idealist, Mm -hmm. but you know, he would distinguish his own view of things of a, you know, a sort of universe of experiential creatures or a democracy of uh, fellow creatures, as he put it, and that there's centers of value everywhere at every scale. And that the human is one uh, at one such scale and is an important participant, but not the only 
source of value and consciousness in the universe. And, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's his process philosophy is a great framework to work within, you know, to bring science and religion together. Cause yeah, he was certainly well positioned to in- inherit and understand the history of philosophy and, and contemporary science. You know, he understood quantum and relativity theories quite deeply. He grasped the significance of evolutionary theory and he was also uh, a close reader of the romantic poets and understood the Im- importance in human psychology and human society of of religion uh, and our images of God or our intuitions of the sacred. And so he wanted to integrate all these things. And I think he did a pretty good job um, doing justice to all of it. Mm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, especially given that point in history too, right? It's um, perhaps even mm-hmm. more complicated now. Well, it was easier then to know as much about science. It's it, There's just too much to know now. <laughs> right. Like I can't even keep up with all the psychedelic startups and this is my full-time job. <laughs> and it's like, it's too much to, it's just flooding. But yeah, you know, this is something um, Whitehead talks about how knowledge kind of goes bad over time too. And right, right. yeah, that's really important. Like a, there's some sort of funny line. It's like, it's a little bit like fish. It goes bad after like three or four days or something. Yeah. He says, ideas won't keep. Something must be done about them. <laughs> so in education, when we're doing education, perhaps we shouldn't just teach like the latest and greatest breakthroughs, but more fundamentals. And history. And I'll, yeah, fuck yeah. You got to teach the history of science. Yeah. I mean, cause then if you don't know the history, you're liable to think the favorite abstractions of your day the paradigm of, mm-hmm. of the textbook that you're taught from is going to last forever, but it's clearly not. <laughs> Take one look at the history of science to know that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right. And, uh, you know, that's a big deal, right? Cause scientists really, they're, they're not in a great position. Like they're often either under the gun to publish by their institution or <laughs> being used as, um, instrument of large corporations and they Mm -hmm. don't necessarily have the right kind of freedom in their time the same way you know university professors from 100 years ago did yeah to dig into stuff like this they need to like really 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 compete and this whole thing's about competition now like even in the classics Mm -hmm. (laughs) like the the fact that greek scholars are competing blows me away Right. And same thing in philosophy, like you must see some really kind of disappointing things at, at times in, in your field. Yeah, well, I mean, it's this, the same principle holds, publish or perish. Mm. There's even fewer jobs for philosophy professors than scientists. And so it's it's very competitive. There's nothing worse than going to a philosophy conference because everyone's just trying to tear everyone else down. There are some notable exceptions. I tend to only go to those conferences. <laughs> yeah, that's good. That's good. Do you know if david ray griffin is still around yeah um he just came out with a new book on on democracy i believe oh Um, cool yeah like a theological take on on uh democracy so yeah he's still around Mm, i think he's in his 90s um maybe just a little bit younger than john cobb who's what like 96 now they're quite old yeah it's, it's incredible like john cobb's mind has kept right up. Yep. <laughs> yeah. I record We uh, had a chance to break off from that Claremont conference and record in his, um, his apartment. It was unbelievable. Yeah. I, I, I've listened to that. <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, it's great. And um, yeah, I'd love to love to get Griffin. I'm, I'm friendly with somebody who spent a lot of time with him in the past. So maybe we can pull, see if he's around to do some audio stuff. Oh yeah. I, I know he just did a podcast for um, the John Cobb Institute. So he's seems to be uh, available. So yeah, you should reach out. Yeah, awesome. That's great. Cool. So uh, we're probably at about an hour now, and I'm I'm kind of curious, or we're a little over. Any kind of like um, suggestions for for people working in the sciences? Like, I want people to keep working in the sciences, but I want I want them to kind of know the limits of what they're up to. But I, I, would, I don't know. Yeah, I would just say stay curious and and don't pretend mm-hmm. like it's your job to explain consciousness. You know, um, there are other manageable problems 
that you can be engaging in. And, and also I would say, don't take money from DARPA to, <laughs> <laughs> to uh, contribute your knowledge to the war machine. Mm. <sighs> yeah. This goes back to understanding your history. Yeah. Yeah. Like understand the implications of empire and it, is the empire game really that much different from what was going on in ancient Rome and Egypt, probably more so right. Rome, but <laughs> and yeah, like it's largely the still, still the same game plan. <laughs> and a lot of people are receiving, a, you know, getting harmed quite a bit as a result of this empire. Yeah. It's a good practice to imagine how future historians might, you know, look back and narrate uh, and describe what was going on in our, our day. Or what you know? What an alien anthropologist might make of the ruins of our civilization? Because uh, if you can mm. take that perspective on yourself, it might help to notice the absurdity of the, all the things you take for granted. Yeah, absolutely. Cool. And um, I guess any anything else you want to talk about? Like, where can people find your your website, or or where are you most active online? I tweet way too much. <laughs> Put uh, at thou art that is my Twitter handle. And, um, my blog is footnotes, numeral two plato.com where, um, most of my activity is. So yeah, you can find me there. Great. And we'll have links to all that stuff on our show notes. And do you, do you have any live classes or, or sorry, pre-recorded classes available online that people could check out or anything like that? Yeah, I've got, um, on my, uh, Patreon, I've got a six part lecture series on process and reality that people can check out. And I'm developing online courses beyond that, but that's currently the only one, um, the process and reality course that's, uh, on my Patreon. So awesome. Yeah. Great. All right. Well, Matt Siegel, really appreciate you coming on and, um, I really hope we can do it again. Yeah, me too, Joe. This has been a lot of fun and, um, I hope your listeners uh, enjoy it. There you go. Matthew Siegel, CIS, and uh, associate professor, I believe, at CIS, um, teaching philosophy. Really just glad to know Matt and Matthew and uh, just happy that he's doing the work he's doing. Really, honestly, just uh, love the work um, of, of philosophers when they engage with this material and... Um, you know, have a holistic approach too, because it's it's not just about the psychedelic experience. It's like the psychedelic experience in relation to the world, and and much more. Yeah. So, I I really want to do more philosophy episodes. We might be doing another philosophy class. I, we haven't really talked about it yet, but you know, stay tuned for that. And yeah. So yeah, thank you, Matthew, and and let's do it again. Maybe I'll drive out to California and hang. All right. So again. Navigating Psychedelics for Clinicians and Therapists kicks off again September 23. We've got some new Australian dates, August 4. That one starts off. Same program, different instructors. You got Dr. Alana Roy, Melissa Warner, and Diego Pinzon, all friends of the show, some some of whom are past students. And again, a 14-day money back guarantee. So if you want to jump in, come on down. Uh, we've got <laughs> Come on down. I keep getting told. I keep saying that. So I'm going to try to stop. Uh, <laughs> and then there's a webinar available on the, on the sales page here at Psychedelic Education Center. So if you want to learn more, please uh, visit the page and sign up and we'll, we'll uh, get you educated. And you can ask me some questions about the class and, and learn more. Yeah. So, all right, everybody. I, I think that's it for now. This is Joe Moore signing off for Psychedelic Today from Breckenridge, Colorado. We'll see you on the next episode in a couple of days. Bye-bye.